Welcome to this Sunday service from St Columba's Church in Ennis, County Clare, with the churches of Kilnasula and Christchurch, Spanish Point. One could argue that each era of the church has been typified by an emphasis, an overemphasis of one aspect of the Trinity to the detriment of the others, interacting with great tidal movements in human history, in part shaping them, but also being shaped by them. The earliest church was a Jesus movement, founded by his closest disciples, people with personal experience of him, who then handed on to the next generation, who remained faithful to a person who they had never met, but who still felt close enough almost to touch. Then, almost overnight, and on the whim of one particular Caesar, the Christian faith went from being one of the most dangerous choices one could make to one of the safest and most socially advantageous, no longer outlawed, but now out in the open, adopted by the Roman Empire as its official religion, the cult of a person, transformed into a vast organisation that matched in certain ways the structures of power and domination that had adopted it. And a price was paid. How deep and how long that price extended is a burning question for us today. And so we start our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You are the never-ceasing open gift of love. We turn in upon ourselves. Lord, have mercy. You live beyond all centres of power. We seek to enclose your grace. Christ, have mercy. You rejoice in a multitude of names. We try to pin you down. Lord, have mercy. May the power of heaven protect us this day and circle us with the blessing of peace. May Christ, our Lord and loving friend, protect us this day and circle us with affection and love. May the spirit of truth who dwells in our hearts Protect us this day and circle and fill us with joy. Amen. And so we pray. Creator God, you made us all in your image. May we discern you in all that we see and serve you in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down before your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his promise for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. And again. Now hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. 
Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me, the door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up, and give him anything because he is a friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish, or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One could argue that each era of the Church has been typified by an emphasis, an overemphasis, of one aspect of the Trinity to the neglect of others. Interacting with great tidal movements in human history, in part shaping them, but also being shaped by them. The early church was a Jesus movement, founded by his closest disciples, people with personal experience of him, who then handed on to the next generation, who in their turn remained faithful to a person they had never met, but who still felt close enough almost to touch. And they were concerned first and foremost with the manner of their living, the faith was known as the hodos, the way, and was seen as a way of being, as people sought holiness of life in, in themselves, but also as a community. That intimacy, that sense of proximity, however, gradually waned with the passing of time and radical change in circumstances. As the church became respectable, no longer outlawed, but out in the open, adopted by the Roman Empire as its official religion, almost overnight, the Christian faith went from being one of the most dangerous choices one could make to one of the safest and the most socially advantageous. And the church transformed into a vast organisation that matched in certain ways the structures of power and domination that had adopted it. The humility of Christ became now less fitting to the purpose. A simple carpenter, a peasant, a working man, a convicted criminal, struck to contrasting a tone with the emperor and other powerful men of influence. This became instead the time of Christ the King, Christ triumphant, Christ reigning over all creation, Christ as majesty. Christ is both the source and the bestower of power. Where Jesus had previously spoken in loving terms of God as Father, even Abba, 
an Aramaic term more informal and intimate, overturning previous notions of God as utterly remote. The old image of a distant, judgmental God began to take hold once again. Churches were laid out in the basilica style, built like the imperial court with the altar placed where the ruler's throne would be. God was great, triumphant, supreme, but also removed from us, not so much with us as over us. God up above, God far away, remote, sitting in glory, in power, and in judgment. And where the Christian faith had once been a movement committed to an ethical, loving, forgiving, pacifist way of life, beyond notions of status and world wealth and power, now it had become an institution bound by status and rules, hierarchies and practices, both obligatory and proscribed. The manner of one's living, the simplicity and purity of the disciple, the reforming of one's heart, gave way to an insistence on right belief, on saying the right things, or at least outwardly conforming, and on the surface appearing to be thinking the right things, demonstrating that one's head was in the right place, obedient and conforming. Or too often what one professed, what one said one believed, was more important than what one did, opening the way all too easily to hypocrisy and corruption. Now, of course, these are broad brushstrokes. The very early church was also riven by chaotic and violent disputes between opposing forces seeking the power to define the faith, to control it, and constrain it. And the later church still threw up people and movements of great holiness. The reform of the religious life through St. Benedict and later St. Bernard, for example. The ascetic mystics such as St. Francis and countless others living lives of simplicity and dedication. But such an authoritarian image of God predominated pretty much until the modern era where theologians in the late 19th and then 20th centuries became once more fascinated by the humanity, the personality, the vulnerability of Christ, however impossible the task of recapturing a truly authentic picture of him might turn out to be. So, whilst orthodox Christian doctrine teaches that God is constant, immutable, unchangeable, Clearly, the history of Christianity teaches us that our images, our grasp, our conceptions of God change greatly as one age gives way to another. In recent times, the Holy Spirit has found great resonance and significance in contemporary Christianity. But where should the Holy Spirit be leading us? This re-emphasis on the Spirit contains within it great potential for good or ill. At worst, it can be complicit with the secular individualism of our time, where the Christian faith becomes little more than a feel-good jamboree. And we can see this in certain forms of worship, where the song, not hymns, are predominantly about the words I or me and focus on what the faith means to me, what it does for me, how it makes me feel. We can all recognise this, it is all too human, but one wonders whether it has sufficiently deep roots to survive the burning trials and disappointments of life. So instead we might hope for something more lasting, more resilient and deeper, more thoughtful to grow. And it is the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, in today's Gospel that might point the way. Your kingdom come. 
but not for us a reworking and mirroring of the world kingdoms that once surrounded us, suffused with corruption, oppression and greed. Instead, my hope, my prayer, my pleading is for the very notion of kingdom to be redefined for a new age, freed from the associations of the past and to discover what I believe it has always truly meant. From the moment these words were uttered, the time when God's rule, God's kingdom, is finally upon us, where the world will be as it could be, should be, where we, each of us, will be as we might and are called to be. Where peace reigns between people, when we are no longer at war with God's creatures or his planet, where justice and mercy will rule the earth. To do so, we should return to that vision of the Hodos, of seeking the way of holiness, to face the profound, endlessly difficult, but also simple demands of Jesus, to love God, the source of ultimate truth and reality, and to love one another as we would wish ourselves to be loved. For too long we have come to see the kingdom as something so far in the distance, a prophecy for the future, a dream, that in the meanwhile we can excuse ourselves by saying we need to live in the so-called real world. And that, of course, lets us get on with the compromises, the accommodations, the cruelties, the wars that we say are so sadly necessary, unavoidable, in which we regretfully, lamentably, and of course unwillingly, must play our part. But as Christians we should not focus on or excuse ourselves by merely waiting for the end times, but look to the now, the world we are in, and what we can do to hasten, to advance, to build the kingdom of God today, and tomorrow, and the next day. We should be engaged in the process of becoming, of ushering in, that which has already happened, rather than waiting for some external and unknown forces to save us from ourselves. Jesus has done his work and his spirit is with us. We are already saved from ourselves. Now we need to act like it. If we wish to live in the kingdom, we need to live for the kingdom. Thy kingdom comes because we know, if only in part, what the kingdom should look like. If we actually want the kingdom to come, we need to act today as much as we can, as if we were already there. If the kingdom is without cruelty, then let us not condone or benefit from cruelty to anything or anyone. If the kingdom is just, then let us not tolerate injustice, especially in our name and to our advantage. If the kingdom is merciful, then let us advance the cause of mercy towards others as best we can and not tolerate its absence perhaps especially when we in the West can benefit from those injustices, for example, allowing us to buy cheaper goods, fuel and food. It is for all of us to ask, what would the kingdom look like? How would it? How should it be? To examine our attitudes and our actions in the light of that insight. And if there is a mismatch, as there will be, then to have the courage to change. And in changing ourselves, to change the world. 
the kingdom is for us, but the kingdom also needs us and cannot come without us. Let us not stand in its way. Amen. We are pilgrims along the way of life. Therefore, let us remind ourselves of the path of faith that has brought us to this time and place. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours, and for the needs of the whole world. Lord, inspire and strengthen your church to speak out against all evil, wherever and by whomever it may be perpetrated. Throughout history, too many have been wounded by those professing to speak and act for the Christian faith. Therefore, may we be ever vigilant in combating our own assumptions and prejudices, so that we shall not inadvertently or by design be a source of injustice, hardship and pain. Help us to repent of any harm we have done and continue to inflict. Christ be with us, around and beside us. Lord, we seek to be at one with you. Help us to be grounded and rooted in your love, in our thoughts and in our actions. We hold before you all who are new to pray, those still finding their way, those who are being taught to meditate and contemplate your presence. We pray for the religious communities, for spiritual guides and counsellors. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray for all whose lives are absorbed by more trivial and meaningless pursuits, for all who are possessed by their possessions, for all who have become addicted, for those caught up in crime and destructive behaviour, as much of themselves as others. We pray for young people who are being led astray into harmful and hurtful ways. We pray for all who have low esteem and feel unloved and devalued. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray for all who speak out for the communities to which we belong, for counsellors and community workers. Bless our homes and families and friends. Support with your love all who sustain family life. We pray for relationships and families in crisis at this time. We pray for all who lack the resource they need for communities with poor medical supplies, all who lack food, shelter and a proper education. For all homes where there is neglect and apathy. As war continues to rage, we pray for the people of Ukraine and all war-torn areas of the world. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray for the saints who in the past have stood firm and witnessed to your love. We pray for those saintly men and women who continue to do so today, no matter what the cost. We give thanks for all we have loved and lost those who may not be famous or numbered among the saints of the church, but who nevertheless showed us ways of compassion, goodness and hope. May their witness be our example of constancy until we come to share with them in the life of heaven. Christ be with us, around and beside us. And now a few moments for our own concerns and prayers for those who are on our hearts.
Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. May Christ, who draws the nations to himself, teach us to love our enemies. May Christ, who entered the water of baptism, lead us to die to all but love. May Christ, who gives new wine for the world, turn our bitterness into joy. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.